think a lot of people would object to me calling Tolkien a really big nerd. Dare I say, he was the quintessential nerd. The platonic ideal of nerd. But if there was one thing that Tolkien was the nerdiest about, it would have to be languages. Throughout his entire life, Tolkien was obsessed with languages, with learning them, with learning the shape of them, the sound of them. To Tolkien, languages were music. It makes sense, then, that Tolkien's life's work, his Middle-earth legendarium, doesn't just contain languages for fun, but was fundamentally shaped and formed to be a vessel for language. Today, we are going to talk all about Tolkien's experience with language, the tongues that he created, and the way that they birthed the story that we all know and love. Tolkien's love affair with languages began at a very young age. His mother took care of his early education, reading him the classics and teaching him French. Of course, even as a child, Tolkien didn't really like the French or their language and preferred to study languages like Latin, which to him had a much more ancient and esoteric feel. He was also hypnotized by glimpses of Welsh coal trucks which came through town bearing long, ungainly Welsh words. It just fascinated him. Tolkien's childhood was spent immersing himself deeply in words, in their sheer fascination and beauty. And when he went to school, his eyes were open to a whole new world of linguistic marvels. He felt an immediate connection to older forms of Anglo-Saxon, such as the Old English found in Beowulf, and he believed that this was due to an intrinsic ancestral memory within him. His mother's side of the family, the Suffields, had been living on the British Isles from time immemorial, and he thought that this gave him a natural affinity for the languages that his ancestors would have spoken. Studying tales of the old world such as Beowulf also brought Tolkien to the Finnish epic called the Kalevala, and on a larger scale, it brought him to the Finnish language. He lavishly describes this revelation. It was like discovering a complete wine cellar filled with bottles of an amazing wine of the kind and flavor never tasted before. It quite intoxicated me. But Tolkien's love of languages didn't only manifest in a desire to learn them or to learn about them. He also wanted to create them. I think that Tolkien's preference for older, often fragmented languages contributed heavily to his desire and skill to create entirely fictional ones. While studying these literary artifacts, you would sometimes come upon a word that had not been figured out, a word that didn't have a definition in your language yet. And so it was up to the scholar to use context clues and their knowledge of the philology of the entire language to discern its meaning. Sometimes there would be a word missing from the passage, and so you would have to use your knowledge of the context of the story and the language to put together the puzzle pieces to come up with an ancient word that might have existed. Tolkien took this craft and expanded on it. He used his knowledge not just to make up nonsense languages, but to come up with languages that could have reasonably existed. Of course, his construction of languages was not always and was not from the beginning an in-depth scholarly pursuit. As a child, Tolkien and his cousins or his brothers would come up with nonsense languages to speak to each other in, such as their animalic language, which swapped out conversational English words with the names of animals. To Tolkien, language was a hobby, a pet project, a game he used to play when he was a kid, but it was also becoming a legitimate academic pursuit. And this dichotomy between it being a hobby and also an academic pursuit seemed to be something that he wrestled with throughout his life. In a letter to his then fiance, Edith, he writes, I have done some touches to my nonsense fairy language to its improvement. I often long to work at it and don't let myself, cause though I love it so, it does seem such a mad hobby. This letter is from 1916, but within just a few years of sending that letter, his linguistic pursuits would take on far more gravity than just being a mad hobby. After his return from the First World War, Tolkien first found a job working for the Oxford English Dictionary, but quickly worked his way up the ladder to the position of Professor of Anglo-Saxon at Oxford. In this academic, philological setting, his Middle-earth stories with their fictional languages seemed a good deal more legitimate. 
The authorities of the university might well consider it an aberration of an elderly professor of philology to write and publish fairy stories and romances and call it a hobby. But it is not a hobby in the sense of something quite different from one's work, taken up as a relief outlet. The invention of languages is the foundation. The stones were made rather to provide a world for the languages than the reverse. To me, a name comes first, and the story follows. Tolkien did not create The Lord of the Rings out of a desire to write epic fantasy. He created it because language cannot exist in a vacuum. To craft a truly realistic fantasy language, one must consider real-life factors such as population, growth, and movement, history, culture, and conflict. He wanted to create languages that were as dense, as full of history, as believable as the fragmented Gothic, Latin, and Finnish languages that he had cut his teeth on. He needed to find a way to make his mad hobby align with his scholarly pursuits, and The Lord of the Rings and His Middle-earth was the bridge between those two ideas. And none of his languages embody this more than the elven tongue. But before we get into that, let me tell you a little bit about this video's sponsor, Surfshark. Surfshark is a VPN, a virtual private network that keeps you safe online. Now that the weather's warming up a bit, I've been able to go out and about to do work. So it's been really great to have Surfshark to keep me safe while I'm using public Wi-Fi. Surfshark lets you send and receive files completely securely, and you can even access bank information safely while using public Wi-Fi. Surfshark is also great for access accessing TV from around the world. I've been on a British TV kick lately, and a lot of it is way easier to access in the UK. Luckily, Surfshark makes it easy to change your virtual location and access whatever you want. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's really no risk in trying it out. If you want to give Surfshark a go and secure your online activity, check out the link in my description or use my code SHIRE to get an extra three months free. Thank you so much to Surfshark for sponsoring this video, and thanks to all of you for checking out my sponsors when I have them. The Elvish language is the one of Tolkien's languages that most closely follows his self-imposed rules. Firstly, the constructed language must feel complete and well-rounded and make sense, and secondly, it must sound beautiful. In a letter, he explains that that second rule is a little bit wishy-washy because everybody has their own preferences, so instead of trying to please everyone, he decided that he was just going to write this language to please himself. According to his taste, then, his elvish languages are rich, complex, and draw their sound heavily from the Finnish language, a language which he claimed provided a glimpse of an entirely different mythological world. His elvish language is characterized and shaped by the fact that it is separated into two branches. Firstly, there is the older form of the language, called Quenya. Quenya was first created over the sea in Valinor, in the company of the Valar, and was brought over to western shores by elves. Quenya is, to modern Middle-earth languages, what Latin is to ours. In the appendices to The Return of the King, Tolkien explains that Quenya was no longer a birth tongue, but had become, as it were, an elven Latin, still used for ceremony and for high matters of lore and song. But this similarity to Latin goes much deeper than mere cultural association. Quenya utilizes antiquated linguistic styles, such as the dual number, which is really only seen in languages like Sanskrit or Ancient Greek. Similar to Latin and modern German, it also uses inflection to indicate the relationship between words, something that has been almost entirely phased out of modern English. By pulling these archaic word forms and inflections out of real-life ancient languages, Tolkien embeds history into Quenya. Within his stories, Tolkien uses Quenya quite sparingly, only in situations that are special and sacred. The longest written portion of the language contained in The Lord of the Rings is in Galadriel's farewell to the Fellowship as they depart Lothlorien. Galadriel is incredibly old and incredibly important. She would have learned Quenya from her days in Valinor, and her use of Quenya in this situation imbues it with mythic importance. She sings, I laurie lanza la si surinen, yen un otim vera maraldaron, 
Invelinte ulda vanie, mi odomadi lise miru voriva, anjune pela vado telumar, nuluini asentintilari eleni, o maior. I retari lien. Quenya is an excellent example of how intertwined Tolkien's languages and world building are. It's not just referred to as ancient for the sake of the story. Every inch of it, from its syntax, its formation, to its usage in the story, carves it out and marks it as something sacred. From Quenya sprung the other major elven dialect, Sindarin. Tolkien calls Sindarin the living language of the Western Elves. It was derived from Quenya, shaping when the elf lord Thingol split away from the other elves and led his group to settle in Doriath. Rather than adapting the beauty and flow of Finnish, Sindarin borrows much of its sound from Welsh and uses more modern, more standard word and sentence structure. Tolkien liked the sound of the Welsh inspiration, saying that it seemed to fit the rather Celtic type of legends and stories told of its speakers. Sindarin is by far the most common form of Elvish, spoken by both elves and elf friends alike, and it even made its way into the ears of hobbits. As he faces off against Shelob, Samwise Gamgee's last ditch effort is a prayer in Sindarin, a prayer that he knows the words of without even knowing what they mean. I el bereth gilthoniel, o men el palandiriel, len alon seeds in guruthos, a tiron in fanuilos. Tolkien was, all things considered, relatively sparing in his inclusion of the Elvish languages in his stories, but we can still feel them in the backbone of everything. Many place and character names are Sindarin in nature, and it creeps out in passages of poetry and song, where you would expect a strange, mysterious language to emerge. And it's Tolkien's restraint here in using the Elvish languages in the right places which makes them work so well. By only giving the audience a glimpse of these beautiful musical languages, Tolkien leaves us wanting more. But that doesn't mean it was easy for Tolkien to have such restraint. He admitted, If I had considered my own pleasure more than the stomach of a possible audience, there would have been a great deal more elvish in the book. But since he figured that a dictionary full of fictional vocabulary words wouldn't have sold, Instead, he created a common tongue for Middle-earth called Westron. Considering that The Lord of the Rings is framed by Tolkien as a found, fragmented text that he translated into the English language, in the text, Westron takes on the form of English. Tolkien explains, What I have, in fact, done is to equate the Westron, or widespread common speech of the Third Age, with English, and translate everything, including names such as the Shire that was in Westron, into English terms, with some differentiation of style to represent dialectical differences. Now, for any other author, this would sound like a cop-out, like it was just an excuse to not come up with another language, but of course Tolkien imbues even his common tongue with uncommon depth. Modern Western, which we're hearing in the Third Age, is an evolution of the older Anduniac language spoken by the men who went on to settle Numenor. There was definitely some Sindarin influence on Westron, just because most of the men who settled Numenor also did know Sindarin, but it does primarily take from the older Anduniac language. Still, many of the place names that Numenorians created are Sindarin in nature, not Anduniac. But this is something that we see all around us today, like how we call the US state Pennsylvania, we call that the Latin-inspired Pennsylvania, rather than the direct English translation, which would be Penn's Forest. Western was known essentially by all the free peoples of Middle-earth, including, you know, elves, men, hobbits, dwarves alike, and it was used as a common point of connection between all these different people. It was not, however, always a monolith. 
For example, the horse riders of Rohan use a much more archaic form of Western, something that is much closer to the original Anduniac language. In the text of The Lord of the Rings, their speech is represented by a sort of pseudo-Old English, because Old English is to English what their language is to Western. Because of this, we don't have any passages written fully in the Rohiric language. Instead, we find hints of it in their names, such as Theoden and Eomer. There was also the sub-branch of Western, basically the dialect that was spoken in the Shire. Tolkien says that although hobbits had adopted the common speech, they used it in their own manner, freely and carelessly though the more learned among them still had at their command a more formal language when occasion required. Tolkien goes on to explain that at one point in Hobbit's history, there probably was a solely Hobbit-ish language, completely not derived from Western. But Hobbits had so adopted the common language, making it their own, making it even more common, that including passages of a original Hobbitish language simply wouldn't have contributed to the story. The use of Western as a device once again belies an impressive amount of of restraint on Tolkien's part. Considering his adoration for the languages of the British Isles, I'm sure that Tolkien would have loved to include long passages of Anglo-Saxon-inspired Hobbitish poetry, or to have the Rohirrim speak long sagas in Old English. Instead, he weaves it into the right places. He uses it to inform people's speaking habits, to shape character and place names, so that it shapes the world and colors it without overwhelming it. Speaking of restraint, let's talk about Tolkien's most secretive Middle-earth language, the Dwarven Kuzdul. We know very little about Kuzdul, in large part due to the fact that it was a secret language. Our only hints of Kuzdul come from place names, and from the battle cry that Gimli shouted at the Siege of the Hornburg. Baruch Kazad, Kazad I Menu. This wasn't done out of laziness, though. The secrecy of Kuzdul does an excellent job of expressing the essential qualities of the dwarven race. Tolkien describes the dwarves as a race apart. Dwarves, unlike all of the other free peoples of Middle-earth, did not come about as a creation of the mind of Iluvatar, of God, but rather as the creation of one of his Valar, Mahal. Mahal shaped the dwarves out of clay, fueled by a love of creating, and dwarves were only accepted as one of Iluvatar's people after their creation. Thus, the dwarves have always been different, a bit secretive, a race apart. They're Kuzdul, then, the language that forms their secret names, the language they don't share with anybody, serves to emphasize their private, separate nature. In secret, a secret which, unlike elves, they did not willingly unlock even to their friends, dwarves used their strange tongue changed little by the years, for it had become a tongue of lore rather than a cradle speech, and they tended it and guarded it as a treasure of the past. Just like a precious gem, a wealth of gold, a secret mountain kingdom, dwarves have guarded and protected their language keeping it shining and untarnished through the ages. But no language embodies the attitude of its creators better than the Black Speech of Sauron. Black Speech was created by Sauron as a perversion of the other languages of Middle-earth. Sauron and the orcs took what they could of other tongues and perverted it to their own liking. Yet they made only brutal jargons, scarcely sufficient even for their own needs, unless it were for curses and abuse. This is a perfect representation of Sauron's hamartia, his fatal flaw. Sauron's progenitor, Morgoth, was obsessed with the idea of creating. It was his desire to create things of his own, things totally devoid of Iluvatar's creative spark, that led him to introduce discord and evil into the world. We see this same pattern in the orcs, who are not their own original creation, but are twisted bastardizations of the free people of Middle-earth. It makes sense then that their language would be a corrupted combination of the tongues of men, elves, and dwarves, barely functional and harmful to the ears. We see the full impact of black speech as Gandalf reads out the inscription on the ring at the Council of Elrond. 
Ashnaz Gdur Batuluk, Ashnaz Gim Batul, Ashnaz Krakatuluk, Agbulzum Ishi Krim Batul. The change in the wizard's voice was astounding. Suddenly, it became menacing, powerful, harsh as stone. A shadow seemed to pass over the high sun, and the porch, for a moment, grew dark. All trembled, and the elves stopped their ears. Never before has any voice dared to utter words of that tongue in Imladris, Gandalf the Grey, said Elrond, as the shadow passed, and the company breathed once more. Black speech is so foul in its very form that just the sound of it summons clouds of shadow wherever it has been spoken. This is the true power of Tolkien's invented languages. None of these languages were made for fun or out of an arbitrary need to expand the scope of his world. Rather, the languages feed into and deepen the characters that speak them. One more honorable mention here is the language of the Ents, which is only really discussed in the appendices, but is still a lot of fun. Tolkien describes it as slow, sonorous, agglomerated, repetitive, indeed long-winded, formed of a multiplicity of vowel shades and distinctions of tone and quality, which even the lore masters of the Eldar had not attempted to represent in writing. Apparently, nobody else in Middle-earth is able to speak Entish, but that's not because it's like a secret language or something, it's just because it's just impossible for them to learn it. And I think my favorite thing about Tolkien's mention of this language in the appendices is that even in just the description of the language, Tolkien himself starts to sound a little bit agglomerated, repetitive, and long-winded. It's just a wonderful example of what a sense Tolkien had for musicality and rhythm within a language and within describing a language. Tolkien didn't just write languages, though. He also dabbled in forms of writing, in scripts, primarily seen in The Lord of the Rings as his Tengwar and Kirth runes. Tengwar is the elegant, cursive-like script created by the Noldorian elves. The form of it that we see most frequently in the Third Age was developed by the rather controversial elven figure Feanor, and it is flexible enough that it can express almost any language, from Quenya, as it was originally designed, to black speech, as we see on the ring. And while being linguistically interesting, there's also something about Tengwar that is just beautiful to look at. The shape of it, the movement of it, evokes the flowing scrolls of Art Nouveau, and I believe that the very look and form of the Tengwar script informs a lot of the modern visual language around elves. The other lettering system that Tolkien created for The Lord of the Rings is a rune alphabet that he calls Kirth. He explains that this form of lettering was first created by the Sindarin elves, you know, Thingol and his cronies, and that it's shaped the way it is because they use this language to mark signs into wood and stones, where the straight, harsh lines of a knife or a chisel would be unavoidable. You see, it would have been very easy for Tolkien to write off his Kirth rune system as just runes. We've all seen runes on ancient monuments and stuff, so you know, it's kind of a given that just, you know, people used to use runes. But Tolkien proves his genius here yet again by not just using that cultural association and letting that slide. He gives it an in-story reason. He gives it in-story depth. I think that this magic, this feeling of an interconnected, fully shaped world, is what made The Lord of the Rings so successful. He wasn't just doing world building for the sake of world building, you know, because it's a requirement for epic fantasy. For him, it wasn't just about fictional dates or fictional wars or esoteric cool sounding names or just enough fictional language to seem legit. Middle Earth was a living, breathing world and at the core of this world was a language, connection, communication from one person to another. I think that The Lord of the Rings is an expression, an exploration into Tolkien's desire to combine his mad hobby of language with a true, well-researched belief that philology is important. He wrote to his son Christopher, Nobody believes me when I say that my long book is an attempt to create a world in which a form of language agreeable to my personal aesthetic might seem real, 
but it is true. Tolkien found language to be powerful, and not just in the sense that it was necessary or logistically useful, it was music. And the way it was used, by whom it was used, how it was formed, is what lends language its beauty. To Tolkien, languages were the encompassment of a society. If you took everything that made us us, our stories, our beliefs, our culture, and you boiled that down to just a few drops, that potent elixir left over, would be language. And Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, which wrangles together his hobbies, his predilections, his scholarly pursuits, and years of research, is the ringing endorsement of the lasting importance of language. It's gonna be incredibly ironic if it turns out that I mispronounced things in this video, but I kind of assume I did, so feel free to correct me in the comments. I will admit that if I had to pick a favorite of Tolkien's languages, this might be a little bit controversial, but I, I kind of really like black speech. It's not often that you're encouraged to spit while you're talking, so I really appreciate that freedom that it gives me. So let me know in the comments which of the languages is your favorite, and I'm sure that some of you have started to learn these languages, and if you have, I wanna know what your experiences have been with that, because I've considered teaching myself a little bit of cinder in here and there, but uh, it seems hard and I'm not good at languages. So if you learned something new from this video or you had fun along the way, feel free to give this video a like because it really helps me out with the algorithmic gods and subscribe if you want to catch a video here every week. Thank you so much for hanging out with me this week and I hope that you have a very happy hobbity day.